Thanks for spending some time with us today. If you're here for the um, ASF webinar series, Real versus Feel, then you're in the right place. If you're if that's not what you're looking for, stay anyway. You're going to enjoy it. We've got incredible panelists. We've got some great questions we're going to ask today. So uh, again, appreciate you guys being here. It's going to be an excellent session. So again, we'll give everybody about one minute to get logged in. Welcome, everybody. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're from. And remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in there. As we go through, we'll put all of our emails and contact info into the chat. So if you have any questions that don't get answered during the session, uh, please know that we will reach out. You can always connect with us afterwards. All right. New Orleans, good to see you, Brian. Marissa, welcome. All right, we'll go just about one more minute to allow everybody to log in. I see that it's filling up. Fort Wayne, Edward, welcome. Jennifer, welcome. LA, just like me. All right, cool. It looks like everybody's getting in here. We'll get started in about one minute. Montreal, all right. Somebody from up north, love it. Chicago, thanks for being here, Jamie. Oh, hey, Carolyn, thanks for being here. Because <laughs> really, if you weren't here, this would be a disaster. So, uh... here too. I saw her. <laughs> <laughs> I right, got some more, some more people from Canada. That's fantastic. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started now. I know some people will still continue to join, but again, thank you guys for being here. Uh, this is the ASF webinar, Feel versus Real series. We've got four episodes. This four, first episode is all about KPIs or key performance indicators. So thank you so much for joining us today. We truly appreciate it. My name is Chris Stevenson. Many of you know me. For those that don't, I'll give you the really quick intro because I'm the least important person on this webinar. And that's actually true. Um, but I've been in the industry for over 20 years, started as a personal trainer, group X, kind of worked my way through every role in clubs owned and operated clubs. Currently, I own the Empower Group, which is a full service consulting firm. Um, so in my experience, I've had the fortune of seeing almost everything you can see in this industry. It's been an incredible run. I believe that we work in the best industry in the world, and I'm proud to be a part of it. And uh, thank you to ASF. Thank you for taking the time, in addition to your products and services that you offer the fitness industry, to take the time to put on things like this to help educate people and help fitness professionals grow and develop, I think is really, really awesome. So appreciate you guys making this all possible. So again, as I mentioned, the theme for this whole a webinar series is real versus feel. And the way this came about was I wrote an article a few years back for the Athletic Business Journal. It was titled Real versus Feel. And what I mean by that concept is real is data and statistics and research and information. And feel is emotion. And what tends to happen with a lot of people is we base too many decisions, especially important ones, on how we feel. And we sometimes neglect the real piece of it. Now, there's always a part where gut feel plays, plays a part in any decision making. But you want to make sure that 90% of the decisions you make are based on real, accurate data. And then that feel, that, that, that gut feeling at the end helps cement that decision. But oftentimes, you know, we're human beings. We fall into that trap. And I think everybody on this call has probably been in that situation where you're like, why did I make that decision? It was an emotional decision. So we're here, again, real versus feel. And in this first episode, we're going to talk about KPIs or key performance indicators. Because what better way to kick off a concept like real versus feel than talking about something as tangible as key performance indicators. So that being said, you know, key performance indicators are things that give us a snapshot of where our business is at. They help us make decisions. They help drive our business forward. They let us know where we may be falling short. They're very powerful tools, but only if you're using the right ones and ones that are effective. And there's so many to choose from, right? And then it's getting the data and then utilizing the data. So it can be pretty overwhelming and it can be pretty complicated. So that's why we're here today is to talk more about KPIs and uh, the role that they play as people run their facilities. So I want to introduce my panelists really quickly. Uh, I'll do a brief intro and then I'll uh, allow them to introduce themselves. But first, we have Kate Golden, who's the executive wellness director uh, or the executive director at the Wellness Lounge at the Newtown Athletic Club. And I asked Kate to tell me something that I might not know about her prior to this. And she said that she lived in Australia for six months. And she said that was one of the most uh, incredible experiences in my life. And then she said, Oh, yeah. And then having my son, Matthew. And when I first thought about that, I thought Australia over a child. And then I thought about my own children. And I was like, 
depends on the day because I've been to Australia as well. And there are certain days I'll take going to Australia over those two children uh, very quickly. And then other days, they're the most wonderful people in the world, right? So Kate, um, that's just a little fun fact. Tell us a little more about yourself and your experience in the industry. Um, well, just to speak the truth out there, I actually said it was the best experience in my life, except oh. <laughs> Matthew, Matthew is, will always be number one. <laughs> um, but so I actually graduated and started my career in human resources in Philadelphia for a healthcare company. And just, this is my 10th year in the fitness industry. Uh, so I was in healthcare first, and then I came over here just around 10, 10 years. And um, I've been at the Newtown Athletic Club the entire time. So I first started out as, um, I'll call myself the HR lady. So I was actually the director of people operations because I think it sounds more fun. And then I did that for like a hot second. And then Jim um, had me, who's the owner of our club, Jim Worthington, he had me go outside and run our pool complex and open it basically from um, like hiring all the employees, inputting all the operations and protocols. And so we did that. We opened up a four acre pool complex with a full service restaurant and bar. And so I ran that for a few years and then I came inside the club and uh, he gave me personal training. And so I ran personal training uh, probably for around six years or so. And um, from personal training, I added on Parisi or group exercise, wellness programs, nutrition. Um, and then around when COVID happened, I went to his other club. We own a small club, um, the Horsham Athletic Club. And I did that for about six months until our wellness center opened. Our wellness center opened close to a year. So March 15th is our one year anniversary. And um, downstairs, we have physical therapy. And then upstairs, we have a med spa. And so my uh, main time now is spent running the med spa and launching um, new programs with our concierge medicine and, and wellness groups. And that's where I am today. Well, that's fantastic. And uh, obviously, with all that experience, uh, you're gonna have some great insights. But I think one of the main takeaways I had from that was, you were committed to making HR fun. And I think yeah, that's a big undertaking and it anybody is. Your employees, want to work with you. That's one of the stats that we should know is how much our employees cost of us. <laughs> well, thank you, Kate. Uh, our other incredible panelist is Carolyn Grassi, and she is the general manager of Quantum, uh, Quantum Fit Life Clubs, and she's in Nashville, Tennessee. And I asked a similar question to Carolyn. I said, hey, tell me something I might not know. And uh, she said that she is a lifelong member of the Girl Scouts. Now, when we dove a little deeper on that, she said, you know, she really identifies with the organization, loves what they stand for and what they do for young ladies and, and is really proud to be a part of things. And I said, I don't know if that's it's where we stop with that, because here's what I think. I think because you're in the cookie racket with the Girl Scouts, and then you open a health club and you're selling cookies so that people have to come to a health club, which, by the way, is genius marketing to get people into your health club. So that was <laughs> what I took. But she assured me it was because of the values of the organization. But uh, tell the audience a little bit more about yourself. Absolutely. So um, I had a very different road getting into the fitness industry. When I initially started my professional career, I worked for Payne Weber, which is now UBS Financial Services. So I was on the operations side for a while. I also did human resources and admin. Um, I was kind of one of those people that I was the mole. I had to do a lot of research. So I was going through a lot of numbers. I've done a lot of data analysis. I could bore everybody to tears with it. So then it was like that information was meant to tell a story. So that's where kind of all that came into play. But over the years, um, my ex-husband was a personal trainer and he also was a group fitness instructor. So about 25 years ago, I started teaching group fitness as a side gig. And um, let's see, it's been, I have to like do the math on this. In 2007, we actually decided to open our own club back in Southern California. So I was actively personal training, teaching group fitness, doing nutrition, um, back on the cookie note, I used to actually, I know I would bake cookies at the holidays and do nice platters of baked goods for our customers because yes, I absolutely wanted them to come back. So for sure, I'm all about that story. Let me tell you how that works. It's fantastic. Um, and then, so in 2018, I actually left Southern California to come to Nashville. I had intended on looking to see if I could explore other avenues found a home with Quantum Fit Life, which was only a couple years old at the time. Um, our owner, Johnny Wilkins, local owned and operated club and we're full service. We've got weights, we've got fitness classes, we've got recovery amenities, tanning. Um, we go outside in the community and we host philanthropic events. Um, 
So we just, we generally do a little bit of it all. And I've been able to bring together all of the people skills, the background that I have in the different departments to help really get our group to collaborate together and work towards that common goal of what the club has while giving each person their own independent thing that they have to focus on for their department to keep everything running. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. And I didn't realize that prior to your career in fitness, you were in data analytics. So talk about somebody who's completely qualified <laughs> to talk about KPIs and yeah. uh, real versus real. That, that's incredible. And for the listeners too, um, we come from two very different clubs. So no matter what size club you're running, whether it be studio full service, we've got the NAC, which is 250,000 square feet, and then we've got 25,000 square feet. So when you take this information in, Think about how you scale it to your business because you're going to get two very different views, which I think is, is going to be great for you guys. So back to KPIs. And for those, many of you are familiar with them. For those that are not, again, they're just things that we find that allow us to track and measure certain aspects of our business uh, that allow us to say we're behind or we're ahead or we're right on track. Um, when we talk about financial KPIs, you know, that might be revenue or um, net profit, gross profit, cash flow. Those things might be KPIs in the revenue area. Um, you know, when you look in the sales area, these are pretty straightforward. Oftentimes in sales, you know, obviously we track closing percentage, cost per lead, uh, how many leads we generate, those sort of things. Uh, and there's things like in the, in the customer experience area where we might track revenue per member, or we might track net promoter score, which we talked about pre-call, um, but those sort of things. So there's all kinds of KPIs. And again, that's where they can get confusing. So hopefully our two panelists will be able to shed some light on that and make things a little more clear. And you'll leave this webinar with some ideas that you can implement immediately in the area of KPIs that'll make a difference for your business. Um, so with question one, again, kind of uh, just talking about KPIs in general, obviously they're very valuable in running a company and running a business, not just in fitness, but any business so um, I had saw this, this um, great quote by Peter Drucker, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, right? So again, that's the real portion of this. So um, I guess let's start with Kate. Kate, what do you feel um, are the KPIs in your, uh, like how do you utilize KPIs in your business? Um, so I think the most important thing is that whatever you're tracking, whatever KPIs you're utilizing uh, or you're any KPI that you are tracking that you utilize it. So um, I used to, because I love data, um, my first degree was actually in IT and I, I really did um, love to pull all the data out there from your check-ins to your demographics, to your leads. And then, then I kind of would get lost in it. And I was tracking so much. You spend all this time tracking all this data unless you can get a really, really good member management system that will give you pretty dashboards. Um, and some of them are starting to come out better. Um, but so I was pulling all this data and it really was kind of a waste of my time. Um, and so then I really now narrow, uh, narrowed down what I needed as a big picture, right? Everybody needs their net membership growth, your revenue per client. And so, um, and also your net promoter score, right? So they're kind of like your three that you always have to keep track, like keep your eye on. And then I looked at it from a daily thing was what do I want each line level employee to know? And it goes by department. So my personal trainers, I want them to know how many first workouts they're doing and their closing ratio. Um, and then I also would customize it to the trainer based on what motivated them, right? So if, if the actual results motivate them more than money, I had some trainers only tracking their results and number of lives they touched and some who are motivated by money doing solely the, you know, how much sales, what their paycheck look like. So I think when you're looking at KPIs, you really have to look at, you know, what's going to motivate your business to grow and how you can manage your team better. And then really how can you manage yourself better as well? Um, so I think that's the most important part of the KPIs is, you know, only track things that you're actually going to, going to use. Yeah, that makes sense. And I like your point. Um, so I'm just curious with you said with the trainers, I think it's a brilliant point. Some personal trainers are really motivated financially. Others are more, you know, sometimes it's irritating when they're not motivated financially because you want to grow their business, but they're like, I just want to change lives, which is awesome and admirable. But you're like, man, you could be so much more busy, you're so much busier, right? Yeah. So when you have two different KPIs like that, do you, are those individually just when you meet with the trainer, this is what we're going to track? Because obviously that wouldn't be for the whole department if you're using different ones. Yeah. So I, yeah. So for the department, no matter what, I kind of still have the money ones. Right. <laughs> so right. <laughs> um, I use an NPS for the department, you know, NPS for the personal training clients. And then we also use um, the revenue per ticket item for 
personal training clients and then how many how many trainer how many clients you have in your closing ratio so across the board like i kind of did that um what percentage of your membership is is training in any capacity but then that's more for the one-on-one -on -one. so i needed to figure out you know this one guy was an amazing trainer but he would text me more often about people he didn't even train that he like corrected their form and now they're um squatting more and he would literally text me like oh did you see this girl's in body like I'm, I'm looking her up i'm like she's not a client he's like i did her first workout like six months ago and gave her a couple of tips and you know like he didn't even train her he was just excited when they would reach goals i was like i am just messing up so i changed his form particularly about how many first workouts he had and then how many um reach their goals and at the end of the day it's still he was motivated to get more people to reach their goals and so if he did that they were buying training more and so it was really about figuring out like what was going to motivate your employees too so individuals have different kpis sometimes i still am tracking what their revenue is right because i still have to but at the end of the day i'm kind of more motivating him on um on how many people are reaching their goals and how long it took them very cool. And then one question, then we'll move on to Carolyn and get her take on this. But uh, in your facility with so many different departments, who sets the KPIs? Absolutely. Oh, so, oh sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> with, I, with setting KPIs, I would say for you, Kate, I'm sure you guys have a lot of interaction because primarily it's Johnny and I, the owner and I, we set the KPIs. But then additionally, because I meet with each of my department heads one on one every week, and they have their own time, we also have a further discussion to say, okay, this may be what your overall department goal is, but to Kate's point of having each individual teammate might have their own portion of that to fill, then it's like you have individual KPIs for your department and for your individuals. So it's a, it's a trickle down effect and something's gonna be more important to me on the overall big picture Whereas I just have to make sure that everything that, that needs to happen underneath to make sure that we're building a nice framework and a nice foundation is happening and that we're not just seeing these inflated numbers based off of data that we really don't know or activity that we really don't understand because we're still able to measure it at that lower level. Yeah, yeah it sounds uh, like- Brian, our CFO, uh, does ours with our directors of each department. Gotcha. And yeah. the directors have input on KPIs for the, the people that yeah. report them? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, Brian's going to be able to tell us like, this is what we have to track in order to, you know, make our numbers and grow our business. But, you know, we, we always want the buy-in of, of your team because um, they're going to help track it too. Yeah. I, I like that too, talking about the buy-in, right? So creating something that has meaning because if it doesn't mean something to the person, then why are they going to care to try to hit those numbers? Right. So, and then right. having to be a little part of the creative process, it does create that buy-in because now they're responsible for this KPI. Yeah. That's excellent. And sometimes some employees, um, you really have to know how to, how to have a discussion with them about the KPIs because then, you know, an employee thought that that's all I cared about, you know, was, was just the numbers. Right. And, right. um, and so that's not fair either. You have to make sure that, you know, it's not just about numbers. We are changing people's lives. It's the fitness industry. Um, right. and so making sure that both are, you know, both are playing, playing a role and that we're communicating about both. It's funny right. you say that too, because, um, sometimes there's like an offline KPI because you have somebody that they have mm -hmm. something that's really important to them. And it might be something that like in atomic habits, it's a small thing that's going to grow and grow and grow. So you want them to have that ownership of that small piece but they have to have the understanding that they need to take part of the bigger picture as well. And then really at the end of the day, it's like, what, what about the relationship? What about the buy-in are we building on? Because ultimately that's what's gonna drive people to funnel the numbers and they feed each other. Right. I mean, there was a, a, um, a club I was talking to a couple of weeks ago and they were tracking all of their sales. Obviously that's something that everybody's tracking, um, but they weren't breaking it down from a new, an actual new join versus a, a COVID recovery join. And so they did that for like the first, you know, six months, but then after that they stopped and now everyone was just a new join. And, um, but then when you look at your um, cost per member of how, you know, your acquisition costs, and that was totally off because you were getting these members back, but you weren't spending marketing dollars to get them back. Um, but at the same time, so, and then when you're trying to compare your data, so a lot of our, our clubs try to compare data. And so if we're saying we have a hundred new joins, but 50 of them were actually COVID recovery joins, you know, someone else might only count their actual new joins. 
So we actually like have COVID recovery joins and then we have new joins and we have other alumni joins. So we really do track it um, three different ways. And so I think that that was also interesting to see that not everyone did that. So it could be dirty data when you're trying to compare um, your KPIs to other, you know, to industry trends or to um, other uh, clubs. I like that dirty data. It, it is sounds cool. dirty data. <laughs> we joined 150 people. Well, actually, yeah. we have 50 new ones. 100 were COVID recovery. <laughs> you know. So avoid the dirty data. Yeah. Um, yeah. Back to the original question. Then you know how how do you use KPIs to drive your business? Caroline, give us your quick take on that one. Yeah, I was going to say this one was a real quick take for me because not to sound like I'm being punny about it, but their KPIs are our roadmap. They tell us exactly where we need to go, but as we're following them along the way you know, we can determine if the actions that we're taking are getting us to where we're going or if we need to pivot and we need to shift. We've done so much shifting, especially post COVID. We have to talk to people differently. What we did a year ago, because one of the things I like to look at, in addition to where we are relative to our budget for the month or year to date, I'm also looking at year over year because those the way that you speak to people changes and the people's needs change. And we've seen so much pivoting in this last year and a half and the needs of people are so different that the way we used to track it before is different now. And so like, Kate, you've got the different categories. Like it's easy to get a rejoin after COVID. It's easier. You don't have to speak the speak. You don't have to invest the time. They already have an idea of what they're getting. They're just looking to rekindle that again. So again, it just for me, I, I think that KPIs in general, they're our roadmap and you pay attention to them, but you can't be driven by them because if you only focus on the numbers, you forget about the people and the relationships that are driving those numbers. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it's funny, I heard this really great quote by Mark Twain that he said, most people use statistics like a drunkard uses a lamppost, more for support than illumination. <laughs> <laughs> now, like, what an approach, what a way to work a drunk quote into a cool webinar on KPIs and real versus feel. But it's true. And I, th I thought of that as you guys were, were talking about that. You know, data is great. But Kate, you began by saying we used to track every single thing and it was a, it, w it really wasn't valuable, right? You have to figure out what matters most. Now, all the listeners on this, everybody has different sized clubs. They have different amounts of staff. So different bandwidth, right? So um, we'll start with you, Carolyn. What if you had to pick two to three, and I know there's more, and again, it depends on the size of your club, but if you had to pick two to three that you think are the essential KPIs that really help run your business, if you had to narrow it down, mm -hmm. what would those two or three be? So I, I kind of alluded to it. I do year over year versus budget. That's very important to me because I like to look in hindsight and then look at where we're going. Um, they do actually have a, a very nice relationship. <laughs> Um, overall revenue, the overall club revenue is a good starting point for me to have conversations with different departments. So for me as the general manager, really critical. Um, and recurring EFT. I look at the growth of my recurring EFT because quite frankly, that's the stuff I don't have to work as hard for. That's the equivalent of my, if you will, my COVID rejoin. When I say that, if I know that my recurring EFT is consistently growing I, and my retention is in there, I know that that's the stuff I'm not going to have to work as hard for, and therefore we can focus our efforts in other areas. So overall revenue, recurring EFT, and my year-over-year -year versus budget are my three keys for my particular role. Awesome. Thank you for that. How about you, Kate? What you got for us? Um, so my three are the revenue per client, your net membership growth, and then payroll to revenue to make sure we're, um, you know, sometimes we run really lean, and then sometimes we run really chubby. So we try to make sure we um, kind Very of have that happy medium. Chubby, running chubby. Yeah, chubby All right, I love right? it. And so we used to kind of be at a place in our, you know, in our maturity of our club, we've been around for, I don't know, 43, yeah, 43, 44 years. And so we were at a point where we could kind of spend extra money um, on different positions in the club. Um, and now, you know, with COVID, we have no extra money, you know, no one does. <laughs> so we try to make sure um, when we came back from COVID, we were super, super lean. And, and now we're um, slowly growing, but making sure that we're keeping like the industry average, I think is around 40%. Chris, Chris might know it more, but right. 40%. Yep. Industry average. So and that's what we run at. Um, I did a presentation yesterday and one of the studies was like 43.7% and we're at 40%. So we do try to make sure that we keep that number. Um, and then one of the 
stats that I'm really looking at this year, which technically is number four, um, is, <laughs> is where our leads are coming from so that we can really um, dive into spending more money in that digital area. So if a ton of our leads are coming from the Google ads and which ad is it? Um, so we're really trying to hone in on that because this is a big growth. Like we're, we're trying to drive uh, new prospects um, hard this year. And so we're really trying to like fine tune where we're spending our marketing dollars so that um, I'm even looking at like who has the high ticket items, like who has those high invoices and then where are they coming from and what, where do we get that particular lead um, so that we can just keep on uh, laser focused on uh, giving that area more money. Awesome. And I think for the listeners, everybody that's tuned in right now, uh, if you're not currently on top of your KPIs or utilizing them, that was one of the reasons I asked the, these um, awesome fitness professionals, our awesome panelists, this question was, there are so many to choose from. And as I said in the intro, it can be super overwhelming, but you got to start somewhere. So those are uh, seven great examples of, you know, starting point KPI. So if you're not doing anything right now, pick one of those to start with, because obviously for two very successful fitness professionals, and I said, narrow it down, they picked those for a reason. So again, you've got to start somewhere. So um, think about one of those. So question number three for you guys um, that I wanted to ask you was, uh, you know, when you're, when you're tracking stuff, is there a particular KPI that you, <laughs> thank you, Jared, I know you'd like <laughs> that one, uh, but is there a particular KPI that you don't see a lot of other fitness businesses using that you feel is really valuable? And uh, just as an example of sort of a, a deep dive, many of you know, Paul Bedford, the retention guru, he's a colleague of mine and a really good personal friend. I was chatting with him and, um, you know, a lot of people measure retention percentage and attrition percentage, and those are, those are important numbers. And, uh, but he said, you can dive deeper to get more accurate pictures. And he said, for example, if you had 100 members and you measured how many canceled prior to the end of their contract expiring versus how many just didn't renew at the end of their contract. So you, you track this group of people. It would give you two different problems that you would then know how to better solve. Because if people are canceling before the expiration of their contract, then you know you've got some sort of service problem. If people aren't, you know, if most people make it through their contract and then don't renew, okay, you've got a renewal problem or or something on that. And so, is there a KPI out there that you're like, man, we've used this and it changed the game in a certain area? And I think more businesses should do that. Um, I was gonna, I would say, Kate, I'll jump in on this one too. Um, so Kate mentioned it, but it actually is a lot of people don't look at your your spend as far as like your spend per member outside of what their membership dues are, because you do get some people who do spend quite a bit of money in the facility. But what you'll also find, and I cross reference this with our net promoter scores, because oftentimes those people that are pulling more dollars out of their pocket and I have three different membership levels. So this is one reason why I look at it. They might not necessarily be my top tier membership, but they're very engaged with the club. They're one of my greater promoters. They're a good source of referrals. They have a great experience in the club. They are a great point of reference to help us understand what type of market we need to go after and replicate to make our job easier to get leads for our membership team for sales purposes and also for asking for referrals. These are our go-to people that they love us. So of course they want to tell us more about us and why they love us and why they love being here. So the, the spend per member is definitely key for us. Fantastic. How about you, Kate? Um, I was just going to share one about when we, when I oversaw all of our fitness areas, we had a system called TNOC and TNOC was a facial recognition system. And we had so much data at our fingertips and we were regramping. We were um, about to embark on this big studio expansion that we just did. I think it was like $16 million. We uh, redid all of our studios and we were trying to really define our programming. And so what we analyzed were the demographics of our club coming in for check-ins versus the demographics of our club coming um, into our programming. And we started to track those numbers to see the differences to make some good decisions on our programming. And what we found was that we had a ton of millennials doing our classes before 9 a.m., but we actually had a ton of boomers coming into the club. So we weren't giving the boomers the programming that they wanted to attend. And so we adjusted our, uh, our programming to have more classes that weren't as um, high impact. And then we increased our uh, class attendance. And so sometimes we have to look at numbers to 
to really make our decisions and you might track them. And now we might not track them all the time. If our, you know, if our numbers are doing well, we're just tracking those numbers, but sometimes we dive a little bit deeper. Um, and so I really think the demographics of who's coming into our club when and what they're doing um, was a, a, a KPI that we, we tracked for about a whole year. Um, so that was one. And then the other one with demographics was that a lot of our clubs didn't have um, men in our group exercise classes at the time when I first started here about nine years ago. And so we did like a, a really quick analysis on, on um, the demographics again, and we launched our six zone program, which now we have like tons of millennials, tons of men doing that program. Um, and so sometimes you get, have to get a little granular to make some decisions. That's awesome. Uh, both of your answers are fantastic. And it, they really tied back into the whole theme, which is real versus feel, right? So when you're especially with, like take what you just said, Kate, with group X programming, it's very easy to see what's trending all over and assume that's going to be great for your club. Oh, this new format is trending really well. We're going to implement that. I feel like it's a great idea. But what you did there was you took all of that research and now you're like, okay, yeah, this may be trending other places, but now we know what's more than likely going to stick if we implement it here. Right. Hit was all the rage, you know, it was number one, number two, right. like always on the trend. But so we had it at every, all these different hours, but we weren't attracting the people. So great. Yeah, no, that, that's excellent. Excellent information. Um, so the next quote or the next question is uh, an interesting one. It's, is there anything that you see people tracking that just you're like SMHing, right? You're like, you don't need to track that. It doesn't offer enough data. You don't think it does. SMHing, I'll, I'll I never you, heard that. SMHing. <laughs> My head. That's because I have a 15 year old. So now I'm kind of more hip and I understand those uh, abbreviations. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I was actually talking with a good friend, colleague and mentor, Brian O'Rourke. And um, for those that know Brian, uh, obviously Brian is, is, is one of the most well-read and, and tells people in our industry. And we were talking about average membership length and a lot of clubs will brag, right? They'll say, I've got a massive average membership length. And he's like, you understand that means nothing. And I, I hate when Brian says that because he's generally right. And I'm like, oh no. And he's like, yeah, because that can be skewed by a small percentage of people that how long, Kate, how long did you say the NAC's been in business? Like 43 years. Yeah, so you probably have people that joined 43 years ago. So you've got this big 43 number. Yeah, you could have a bunch of people who join and cancel. But that average gets offset by this small group of people that's been members for so long that that might not be really valuable data. So what do you guys see? Or maybe it's something that you tried to track for a while. And all of a sudden you're like, you know what, this is just not worth it. I'll tell you the last club we owned and operated, uh, you know, we track net promoter score and we never stopped tracking that, but I would report it to the staff every single week. Right. I was like, okay, we were up one. And, and here's why I think it is we're down two, and we had a staff meeting and I'm big on feedback. So I was at, did meeting surveys afterwards. And the overwhelming feedback from our staff was, if I have to hear Chris talk about net promoter score one more time, I'm going to jump off the roof of this building. So obviously it was super important to me. So then I reduced telling them weekly to the monthly. And then it was a little more meaningful because there were bigger changes and there was more to report. Um, so I didn't stop tracking it, but I changed the way I shared it with the staff. But is there anything again that you think people track that they just don't need to, it doesn't give them the data they think it does or things that you're like, I'm going to track this. I'm going to stop because it just did not give me any real valuable input. I mean, I would just say that if you're tracking it and using it to make business decisions and it's improving your business, then you should continue doing it. Um, I, you should, the only thing that I think is a waste of time is something that you're actually not using to make decisions to drive your business forward. Um, like right now I'm tracking Google reviews. I've never tracked that before. Like the actual number of Google reviews we have, the number of Facebook reviews we had, we always track to see what our rating was, you know? Um, but in order to improve our SEO, we need our Google, we need more Google reviews. So someone else might not think that's valuable, but that's kind of, we're building a whole new um, website domain. So we need to increase that for us. And would that be something you might stop? So all of a sudden you get to the level you yeah. want. So I think once sense. we have a couple hundred and um, then I won't track it as, as often, mm -hmm. I would say like, I literally have a team goal right now. And if, if we get the 20, um, 20 reviews every month, then we get bonuses. And cause that's what I want right now, <laughs> but you know, and then I'll change it. I'll change the goal um, to align with what our, you know, what we really need to do to improve in our business. Right. Very cool. Carolyn, what you got for us? So, um, I mean, we're a younger club. We're only five years old. Um, attrition is something I know, again, back to like attrition retention, how a lot of people track it. For us, attrition is actually not a real good one because 50% of my numbers, those people are leaving because they're moving out of the Nashville area. We have a very transient 
just culture in general. They come into town, they take this job, they get a promotion, they move out of town. So even if I were tracking like length of membership, 10 months is about tops for me. So I'm constantly replenishing. But now I'm gonna sound like I'm talking out both sides of my mouth because attrition is something that's way down there because you still have to have a pulse on it. But it gives us a way to even talk to, okay, that 50% that's moving away, is there a potential audience? Do we need to start investing some time in providing um, online training? Do we need to provide something where they can still be attached to us? Or as what we've come to realize in surveying some of those people is when they're done, they're done. They move out of the area, they find somewhere new, which actually gives us an opportunity just to reinvest our time into the people who are staying longer term and understanding if we have a service issue for that other 50% that's leaving, like where are they going if they're not moving? So again, it sounds like I'm talking on both sides of my mouth, but for my club, attrition is just not something that's super critical for us. No, I, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I like the, the way you gave that specific example. Uh, I thought it was very easy to see and understand. I, th I think that's excellent. Um, how about Carolyn, is there, and I'm putting it on the spot, but, um, uh, has there been any KPIs that you've installed that you would thought were really unique? You know, because we have all the traditional ones where people track revenue and profit or, or, you know, closing percentage or revenue per member. Anything you've put in there that was like just a really unique kind of off the beaten path sort of KPI because you were looking to achieve a certain goal? Well, group fitness is something that we offer in our club, but I will tell you it is not something that's very high attendance. Mm -hmm. It's more conceptually about how it gets people through the doors with the idea they might take a class. So one of the things we started tracking was to see unique members that are taking classes because I actually have some people, I have limited unique members. I have a lot of people that are, um, and I, I'm, I'm trying to come up with something here that's a really nice way of saying it, like, sorry, everybody, they're class whores. They literally go and they take like three classes in a row. So they're beefing up the numbers in the classes. It looks like we have a lot of activity going on in the classes when in fact it's one person that's taking three different classes and filling three different seats. So then it gives us an opportunity to just, you know, it gave us an opportunity to really look at what unique number of people were taking them. Did we need to invest more in our platforms? And honestly, after listening to what Kate was saying about the way they track their demographic, that may be a better approach for us um, because we're, our demographic is shifting a little bit. So the numbers that we were tracking before with the unique members may not be the place that we need to be going now. So Carolyn, really quickly, we had, we had a question coming through the chat. Um, and it was from Jared and he said with the high mover population, that also yes. means people moving in, those should be hot targets to replenish that loss. Do you use the new mover program in your area? Just curious. So, really interesting. Um, the new mover programs that are in our, in our area, and we just recently got up a phone call, like no joke, about two hours ago with a company that does that. Um, we've been unsuccessful in the past because typically um, for my club, just to give everybody an idea, my lowest cost membership for just the facility in general is $75 a month. So that gets you no bells and whistles. It gets you in the doors. Um, my classes, um, I go up to $189.99 and that's my boutique style classes, recovery amenities, it's full bore. Um, so a lot of people, what we were finding weren't attracted to that new mover piece. But what we are doing differently is, is that we're doing some geofencing. So the new mover didn't work for us. We tried it for about an eight month period of time. The people that came in, it was, it was like we were having to convince them to come to the location. And honestly, we were setting ourselves up for a bad relationship because those people typically would kind of guilt themselves into joining, even though it really wasn't in their budget. And that's not fair to the relationship. So we just shifted to where we're now um, marketing more towards uh, geofencing. And so we are looking into new neighborhoods being built, but what we're targeting differently there is we're targeting them with the geofencing based on the cost of the housing that's going in because we know they have the expendable income to spend in our club so that we have a better relationship. And that also goes outwardly into publicly how they speak about us. So we become a club that actually suits their need versus one that's trying to, you know, get money out of their pockets when they really can't afford it. So that's, um, that's how, that's what our experience has been with the moving population. Carolyn, thanks for the answer. And Jared, hopefully that answers your question. And uh, twofold, one, great information. The other thing is prior to that question, I think Jared's uh, biggest takeaway was the term running chubby. <laughs> yeah. So at least <laughs> valuable information in addition to 
running chubby. <laughs> and how about you, Nate? Um, Any, like, like as an example, what you said about the Google reviews, totally. Right, that's what I was thinking. Like Google reviews, yeah, like a niche, like niche. Our, one of our KPIs that we were, that I'm tracking right now. Um, one of the KPIs that I think I use a lot to make decisions on new programming is the revenue revenue per square foot. I think some clubs have to look at it and some, I mean, obviously if you um, are trying to designate certain space um, to something like childcare, like should you have childcare? Is it keeping members? Is it, is it attracting new members? Um, or someone actually said that I should put tanning beds in the wellness center. Um, it only needs a small little square foot of space. We should do that or spray tanning because I get spray tanned a lot. And they're like, I bet you your um, members what, or your uh, clients would want that. And they're right. They probably would want it. And maybe if it was like a driver of new traffic, but at the same time, the same square footage, we can do a thousand dollars per hour in that same room. And you can't do that with um, a spray tan, right? Spray tan is 30 bucks. So for us, that's just like an easy, um, that's how I make like an easy decision. Nope. I'm not going to waste time you know, investigating it, researching it, seeing if the, our market needs it because it, it just doesn't make sense for us. Um, so I tend to do that even um, with prioritizing, you know, with your checklist. I think of my KPIs when I'm prioritizing my day, you know, is it driving new business? Is it keeping business? Is it keeping my employees? It's going to the bottom of my list. Right. But Actually, I don't have any other cool ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. You'll, you'll, you know, you'll think of one as soon as we log off. You'll be all yeah. bummed out. Yeah. Um, and again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Again, you'll have our contact info. So if you have questions for our awesome panelists or myself, you can always reach out after the webinar if, if something pops in there. Um, was there ever a time, uh, Kate, we'll start with you, mm -hmm. that a KPI result blew your mind where you started to track something and you were like, Houston, we have a problem or vice versa. You just had a KPI that you were like, geez, we are killing this. And this means we got to do more of this or that sort of thing. So just one of those moments where you're like, this, this is an excellent example of why you need to use KPIs. And this is how it sort of changed the game in a good or bad way for us. I think it was more of um, my dirty data comment that <laughs> we had our highest check-ins. Like, you, you know, we do our check-ins every month, every day, and our highest check-ins is July. And so, um, but we have the outdoor pool complex. So it made sense that a lot more people were still coming in July, but really it was not unique users. And um, so I really think that to Carolyn's point of looking that she has those group exercise people, for example, who are coming to three classes, we have them too. We also have some users who are coming in, um, you know, twice a day with our pool, sometimes three times a day. So that was just a, an area where I think that it was surprising. So we were like, wow. And then all of a sudden we're like, mm, no, it wasn't, it wasn't as cool as we, as we thought it was um, to, ha to have those extra check-ins. And then the other one is we have birthday parties. So I don't know if you guys have them, but when you're tracking revenue per month, um, you know, something that we have to look at, we're in the Northeast. So we actually look, now we are counting our snow days, right? Because that's lost revenue for a lot of our ancillary departments. And so if we had 10 um, snow days last year that the, you know, that we closed programming for, and we didn't have it this year, our numbers might look a lot better or a lot worse depending on weather, which is also crazy. Same thing with rainy days. Like there's all these different, um, I think they were like the wow moments of what everything that impacts your KPIs. We, the birthday parties, if there's only, if there's five weekends, you have more revenue. If you only have four, you have less revenue. And so when you were looking at just the months, month over month, you, you really couldn't look at that. You literally had to like count the weekends in the month compared to year over year. Um, so I think that was like the most mind blowing thing to think about is like why were our numbers off. And when you do some digging and research, literally if it rained half of July, one year versus the next year, you know, and we didn't think that like even track that in the beginning, but Jim what, has what a, it, a calendar together, like our rainy days for the pool complex, you know, we're not, we could do, you know, $200,000 in, in a month. And then if the next year we only did, you know, 150, a lot of times it's because of the weather. And, you, and that's interesting too. And, and I, I do, the, the term dirty data is really good, right? Because sometimes things look better than they are or look worse than they are when you really dig. And that's important that when you look at these KBIs, you dig. Um, and an example of tracking the rain days, that's something that would not be an effective KPI where I'm at in Southern California because right. it's two, right? We don't have, them. Right. but you know, I joke, but that's a serious thing, right? Uh, very applicable to where you're at in the country. So that was really good. How about you, Carolyn? Something that you were like, oh boy, we got to fix are, this or we're killing it. Ours, well, there were two things. One had a lot to do with our check-ins because we have a very active club. I have 80% utilization. My Incredible. people come to the club, they use the club, they're in here all the time. 
Um, and so when it, especially when it came to staffing for us, um, because we wanna make sure everybody's being serviced, we would look to see, okay, well, we had a ton of check-ins, we book a lot of people, and then it was like, okay, wait a minute, we had all these check-ins, why did we book all these people? But we had to go back and match our calendars to activities happening in the city. One thing that happens when you're in a city that has a lot to do, you have to pay attention to what sporting events are in town, what conferences are in town. We do a lot of business as well with day pass people. So for us, it was taking a look at the calendar and seeing how that impacted the flow of our members coming through the doors and how it helped us with our staffing or hurt us with our staffing if we weren't looking at the right things. And so comparing those two were really important. Um, more recently, we have our fit lab area is our collection of uh, classes that would basically compete against group fitness so there are class formats but it would be like oh hey this is the equivalent experience that you get in f45 this is the equivalent experience in an orange theory and they're housed under one roof for a period of time we were watching a lot of growth in there our our sales team was killing it they were putting a ton of people into there the numbers were going everybody thought it was great but people weren't paying attention to the downgrades People weren't paying attention to the negative numbers. Like you get this bias that you're so excited that the numbers you want to go in the right direction are that you forget about that part underneath that's like, well, I'm gonna sit down here for a while and then at one point I'm just gonna pull bottom out. And that's exactly what happened because the department was actually being built off of one individual. And right before we terminated that particular individual, basically they were creating this complete cancer and everything was about them. We watched the numbers drop the month before we let her go right back to where they started and we lost all of the prior six months growth because we were so focused on the good numbers you've got to pay attention to what's going on behind the scenes too so that was mind-blowing because normally you go oh we're paying attention to the numbers we're growing like this is good we weren't asking questions right yeah that makes sense um very concrete examples. So thank you both. Uh, one sort of a little bit of a tangent thought, but so you're talking about a lot of data, a lot of numbers, and I've met club owners who don't share anything. They feel everything is super sensitive. They won't share any numbers like revenue numbers, profit numbers, those sort of things, which would be considered KPIs to most people. Some don't share anything. And then you meet other owners who are complete open books with everything. And there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just curious to what level you think information should be shared with staff in regards, you know, you're sharing KPIs, they've got to know some things. Uh, what level do you share? How open do you, are you in particular? And again, there's no wrong answer, right? It's all about the way you run your business. So I'm just, just curious. Carolyn. Okay. I was going to say, um, oh. <laughs> because we're a new business um, for the first couple of years, our owner did not share any data with anybody. Um, it was basically, we're here, we're a club, we're running, you get your paycheck, like, and I make that sound so watered down because that's not his personality, but um, he didn't share anything. And over the last few years, um, he and I have really dove through things and he now is a complete open book. So in the last three years, our leader team, we get monthly p &L statements. They are an active part of the budgeting process. They understand what's going on, what we're applying for, um, everything through COVID with any type of grants that we were looking at. So he is incredibly open with it. And I think in particular for our leadership team, that helps them to have the appropriate tools to govern their departments and really have buy-in and understanding of what their role is in, in being a part of that bottom line number and being a part of that movement. So yeah, we're open book right now. Excellent. Caitlin. I, I was raised by Jim Worthington in this industry and we share <laughs> all of our numbers with everybody. <laughs> I mean, from anyone in the industry, we'll send, we send P&Ls. Um, he shares his P&L with all of our staff. Um, I used to make P&Ls for each trainer so they could see, you know, how much they're, how much they're costing us and then how much their, their take is and how much our take is um, and why we get a take, you know, and you can show that value. Um, so he has always been open about everything and he'll have a meeting with everybody and go over it and all of our debt. And, and now he even puts on there, like what our, what our loan amount is. And, um, so that we can see how much we have to pay down and, um, so yeah, so we're very open with all of our data. Yeah. I mean, that's the way I always was. Uh, 
you know, and with clubs that, that I've, I've run. And I, I feel like that's the way to go, but there are definitely still people out there that don't, and that's okay. I was just curious mm -hmm. where you guys sat with that. Um, yeah. I just saw Jared commented, Jim equals goat. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you who don't know Jim, I've gotten to know Jim through my URSA board experience and, and Jim is awesome. And he's done a ton for this industry uh, in so many different areas. But Kate, if you had to describe Jim in two sentences, two. In two? I know the knack does everything bigger, so you're probably gonna be four sentences, but if you can right. do yeah, 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 we do. Sentences, just for the listeners who aren't familiar with Jim. Um, to be honest, I could probably sum him up in one word. He is <laughs> passionate. Like he okay. is so passionate about whatever he does, whether it's like literally picking up trash or if he's building a you know a hundred million dollar business. He is just the most passionate man and um he gives everything like 300 percent and one of the things that I love about him is he's instilled in me that every single day I can be better than I was yesterday. And he instills that in us every day. And I think, and he, he lives by that. He's also, yeah, I can't, hmm. he's super generous. He is the, you know, he donates to everything and um, he's philanthropic. He, we created a nonprofit here at our club. So yeah, I can't do it in two sentences, but he's a he's oh, a and then you lied. You said you could do it in one word. I know, not, but I kept going. The whole paragraph. He's, he's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's important because he has done a lot. So thank you for sharing that with the audience for those um, out there that don't know Jim. Uh, so kind of one last question, then we'll, we'll bring everything back together. Uh, give me an example of something that you would share with your team publicly and how you share it. Um, I know, for example, something we've done with clubs that we consult with and clubs that we've run is we'd have an annual theme and it was generally based on a KPI. So as an example, back to net promoter, uh, way back when our, our promoters, uh, net promoter score was in the high 70s. So we created a KPI called go to 80. And what we did was we put a big poster in the office and we had go to 80 on it. And we had our staff come in and we had markers in there and they were going to write things on that board that they felt would make people give us a higher score the next time they took their survey. So it was, you know, um, deliberately engage with people more, memorize people's names. And we had this go to 80 campaign and we would share that number. And, uh, you know, when we hit that goal, and stuff, is there anything that you guys sort of rally your team around or something that you share publicly or on a board or any, I'm just curious. And the answer might be no, but is, is there anything like that? Currently, I have um, literally on our board, it, it like says that we want, I want to do 10, 10 grand today. And then I track it throughout the day. Like I will do updates through the day and say, oh, we're at, we're at five. We need to, you know, sell more packages or get more product sales. Um, so I have the, and I used to not do that, but the, I think it, it motivates everyone. I saw it during our holiday promotions. Um, I put all the holiday promotions that we were doing and then how many we did and where they were done. And people killed it when they could see it right on that whiteboard. Um, so right now I have the Google reviews, I have my revenue, and then I also have our rebookings for you know future appointments. And so, everybody yeah. can see it. Yeah, and then our goal though is to do 200 grand a month in our wellness. Um, and if we do, I'm taking everyone to the Four Seasons. So everyone knows that that's like our, our big goal is to do it, do 200 grand in a month for it, so. Very cool. I can't wait for guys, cool. everybody on the same page and motivate. Yeah. Carolyn, any, anything from you? So it's funny because we don't have the numbers based um, collectively as a club, which I can definitely see the value in that. Um, each of our departments does have separate campaigns that they work on, and it's mostly with our personal training and our membership team, which is our sales department. But um, ultimately, we do take a theme based on our core values. So we might use our principal statement as our focus of what we're looking at really inviting people into and the experience that we're creating so that we can replicate it to drive the numbers. So for the club, it does, it's not a feel good thing. It's literally like, you know, we empower people to live their best life, a fit life. And that's our purpose statement. So that might be one major theme. And anything that we do ties into that, whether it's a public service announcement that we're posting on our Instagram pages, or it's just data that we're giving. So we know what the end result number is as the leadership, but in the manner in which we motivate everyone else, we try to incorporate our core values into that. Very cool. By the way, for the listeners, two very good follows on Instagram. So make sure that you you look them up, or maybe you guys could put the Instagram handles in the uh, into yeah. the chat. Absolutely. Um, but both, I've seen both of the clubs do some very, very cool stuff that we can learn a lot from. So um, make sure you enter that. And again, we'll put our contact info in the chat. So if questions pop up after, you can reach out to us and, and uh, you know, we're all here to give back and, and help out however we can. Uh, so just to kind of bring things then to a completion here, um, Carolyn, any sort of final thought? And then also, 
what is the one thing you'd like a listener to do the minute they log off this webinar that will make a difference in the area of KPIs? Make okay. it good because this is your it's final, my final, my final thing. So um, final thought, balance is critical. So there's people in activity created to your numbers. Um, don't just look at the numbers, you lose sight of the activities and that's what's gonna drive your numbers. There's a book called Competing with Luck about misusing correlations. Um, we talk about a lot of the like correlations and not causality and that's super critical. So be curious and always ask why. The second you log off from this, I want everybody to go and take a look at what are the numbers you're paying attention to? Are you paying attention to any numbers? And then are those numbers relevant to where you wanna go as an organization or as a department? That's it. That, that that was, my, mic dropped pretty good. Yeah, if you had the mic, you would drop it right now. I Great wish job. I went first. <laughs> <laughs> you should have the mic. Um, what do you have for us, Kate? Okay, so my biggest takeaway for everybody is to make sure that your line level employees have KPIs. So I think we, a lot of times we look at it as just our management team has the KPIs, um, just the owner, but, and KPIs that you're comfortable with sharing, but just at my, like at the very, at the front desk, we have a, a just a piece of paper. It's not fancy. It's not, but it's literally so that they can track like how many appointments they, um, how many appointments they made and then um, how many packages they sell. And that's all they're doing, but they just make a little tax, like just like a little one and it's super simple. But if you get everybody to focus on what KPIs matter to them, um, and then I would say, make sure you have events scheduled to meet with your team about the KPIs. So especially when you are a smaller club and it's just you, you kind of feel like everything's on your shoulders. But if you can schedule an event, like I schedule my one-on-ones every week, it's a scheduled event and we go over the KPIs for each individual. Um, so I think that's um, super important too, to make sure that you're not just, you know, they're not just on a whiteboard. They're not just in an Excel spreadsheet or on your fancy TV for all you fancy people with your data up on your TVs that I'm jealous of. Um, you know, you can't, you have to talk about them. Yeah. Chris Crater from ACAC. He has like a big, beautiful, nice, all the data up there. Um, <laughs> but so you have to talk about it. You have to have meetings about it and you have to actually utilize that data in those conversations because um, you're going to use it to make decisions. But I really think getting the feedback of your, um, you know, everyone from your line level employee to your management team and figuring out like why the numbers are the way they are, um, there's a story behind them. So I think that's my, that's my takeaway for you. Make sure everybody has them and make sure you're talking about them. Excellent. Well, thank. I mean, that was phenomenal. So I can't thank you guys enough for making this webinar incredible and making my job super easy, which I think is the most important part. You made this really easy for me. Um, but so I think it's safe to say that we've covered the ABCs and you know your P's and Q's for KPIs. So FYI, uh, if you have a question, we'll get back to ASAP. Uh, sorry, I was just doing a bunch of initials. Um, but anyway, in all seriousness, yeah. uh, I, I, you know, it was great hearing great information from two people that are in the trenches daily. So this wasn't theory. These are best practices. And you've heard some of the successes, some of the shortcomings, and that's what builds us into great professionals. So again, thank you guys so much for sharing your, uh, taking time out of your busy schedules. I know you're like, as soon as you log off, you're going right back to work. Um, so we truly appreciate that. I know I speak on behalf of ASF and, and the audience as well. Uh, I do want to let you guys know that the next episode, and we hope you enjoyed this one, will be Thursday, February 24th at 11 p.m. Pacific time. That's 2 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to keep with our th uh, theme of real versus feel, but we're going to move into a topic called survey says. So similar to KPIs, you can survey and you inquire a lot of data, but are you are you really surveying correctly? Are you getting the right kind of data? And if you are getting the right kind of data, is it dirty data? Are you running chubby? Those are two things I'm going to try to use in as many sentences as possible moving forward. Um, but it'll be all about survey and data acquisition and then implementation. So another great real versus field concept, and that'll be episode two. Um, so thank you again to ASF for making this all possible and caring about uh, caring enough about our industry to help educate and help us all become better fitness professionals. Again, to Carolyn and Kate, our wonderful panelists, I can't thank you guys enough for being here and taking the time out. And of course, you, the listener, the fact that you're on here growing through consistent learning is, is incredible. The fact that you're we're working the best industry in the world where you literally get to change people's lives and you're on here taking time out of your busy days to learn how to do that better. That's outstanding. So I know that time is a commodity and we're grateful you spent yours with ours. So go ahead and log off and keep on changing lives and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you guys. You guys.